Welcome to the Copper King Mine and Railroad. Today we're going to talk about building Garfield's 1200 foot smokestack. So stay tuned. Construction of the Garfield smokestack. The stack is 1,215 feet tall. It was part of the 1974 175 million dollar smelter emission control program it will turn into a 280 million dollar project though over the years the utah copper division unveiled details of the plans in a may 9th meeting here's a picture of that meeting now this was to meet the ambient air quality standards put forth by the epa Here's a drawing of the improvements that will be made at the smelter. And then an engineer concept, a picture of how the stack will look at different locations in the valley. With the smelter's location, the mountainous terrain, and wind flow patterns, made the smoke stack an important part of the emission control program. So let's talk about constructing this large smoke stack. The base was poured starting Friday, June 21st, 1974. It was in a continuous pour around the clock for two days, ending Sunday evening, June 23rd. 70 ready mixed concrete trucks from two companies, Concrete Products and Geneva Rock, delivered 10,000 cubic yards of cement. 300 yards per hour, non-stop, for two days. Here's some pictures of that pour they did. To slow the curing time, they substituted ice for part of the water. 700 pounds for each load. That's 1 million pounds of ice they needed. It was stored in 22 refrigerated railroad cars at Denver Rio Grande Western's Roper Yard where each truck would receive its 700 pounds for each load. This would cool it down to 60 degrees. Here's a photo of a truck getting iced at the Roper Yard. 900 tons of rebar still was used, most of it the largest gauge, two and a quarter inches in diameter, and still beams welded together in place to tie it all in together. Here's some pictures of that rebar and that still they used. The base is shaped hexagon, 177 feet across and 12 feet thick in the center. Approximately 10,000 cubic yards of cement was needed. So this picture shows floodlights for round the clock working. Then they use water atomized sprays, making it 95% humidity to slow the curing time also. So in the picture, you can see the floodlights and the spraying going on in this pour during the night. 60 workers placing concrete and then 300 people in all were used to pour this base. Sunday evening, June 23rd, after two days of uninterrupted pouring, the last load of concrete was placed. Then they covered it with burlap and wet it all down. Now the stack construction started August 26, and it was in a semi-continuous pour. They worked 24 hours a day, Monday through Friday, and then took Saturday, Sunday off. This picture taken five days before the pour shows them stockpiling all this material for that stack. Look at all the reinforcing rebar they had laying out. They poured the stack with a slip form method raised by hydraulic cylinders 8 to 11 inches an hour, 20 feet a day, 100 feet a week, all the time adjusting the circumference and the thickness of the stack walls, starting at the base 124 feet diameter to the top diameter of 40 feet, wall thickness 30 inches at the bottom to 12 inches at the top. This picture all is ready for the start of that stack pour, August 26, 1974. Special strength, 4,500 pounds per square inch concrete was used, and that was provided by Utah's to sand and gravel. Picture shows last minute details just before the first concrete truck arrives. 
Now this is a picture of the catwalk and the slip forms that they used. Engineer Merle Stanberg is pictured. Now August 27th picture shows the progress of the first day's work. And then the same day inside the stack shows the movable forms and rigging. This picture shows the stack height equivalent to a 12-story building. The tw September 24th picture shows the stack reaches 315 feet, averaging 20 feet a day. By October 2nd, the stack is at 480 feet. And then the whole picture shows what's going on around the smelter complex. Now this photo was taken from the southwest hillside. Here's a great picture taken by the Deseret News of that stack. The stack was topped on schedule Sunday, November 17th, 1974. Here's a Don Green photo from the helicopter of that stack. This picture labeled J.L. England, Senior Project Engineer. And another part of the story says his name was J.L. Peterson for the Kellogg Construction Company. He was the chief project engineer. He's on the stack right here. Inside the stack is installed this 24-foot reinforced fiberglass liner. Here's some pictures of that liner inside that stack. Note the size of that man working next to that liner. Now, this is a picture of the tapered clean-out for the flu or the liner. This photo shows the opening where that fiberglass liner will enter. Now, this picture is looking down from the 300-foot level inside the stack. The 24-foot liner or the flu looks small against the 124-foot diameter at the floor base. Here's a nice colored picture looking up from the floor. Now the reinforced fiberglass liner extends 15 feet above the stack, making the height the 1,215 feet. This picture shows with the help of a helicopter, panels that are being placed to seal off between the stack and the liner. And yes, there is an elevator, Swedish built, running on geared track that will take you up to the top. It takes you 20 minutes. Here's some pictures of the view from the top of that stack. There's also a sampling station at the 300 foot level. What is service daily? Here's some pictures of that sample testing station. Look at these pictures looking up the stack. These are some nice pictures. Here's a picture September 1978 from the Deseret News of the stack. Then we have a 1908-1977 comparison picture of the smelter now and then. Over the years, there has been, well, as of 2014, four versions of the smelter built on this Garfield site. So here's some pictures of the smelters over the years. This first one was 1905 when they was building it, then 1913 and 1946. Here's a 1959 picture of it. The stack is the tallest freestanding structure west of the Mississippi and the fourth tallest in the world. So here's a diagram of the tallest smokestacks in the world. The stack is an icon for people traveling in and out of the valley. Also, it's a geographic indicator for boats on the Great Salt Lake. Now, my daughter lives in Tooele, so we use it as an indicator for where we are at when we visit each other. But we call the stack Isengard from the Lord of the Rings. So we say things like, oh, we just passed Isengard, or we're almost up to Isengard. Because it is such a landmark, many pictures have been taken of it. So let's look at some of these interesting shots taken over the years.
my friend James Belmont, a famous professional train photographer, has taken numerous photos of trains with the smelter smokestack in the background. So let's look at some of these. There's some really great pictures taken by James Belmont. So that's the building of the 1974 1,215-foot smokestack.